And so we find that going on. And then the second thing he says is to pursue godliness as a community amongst one another in the church. And that's what we find in chapter 2. In, in encouraging godliness as a church, making disciples. And in chapter 2 especially, we see this uh, fact that, that, godly, that God's grace should produce godliness in our lives. We see that especially as Paul grounds chapter, uh, uh, in chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. He grounds it in God's grace. But then, we, we, after we look at that, there's another task. There's another effect of the gospel. And after we look at it, we might wish that Paul just ended his letter at the end of chapter 2. We might just sort of wish, hey, Paul, why do you have to include chapter 3 as well? <clears throat> Let's read those opening verses of chapter 3 together. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil <clears throat> of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. Now that's a pretty intimidating set of commands packed into two verses, right? But Paul wants, uh, the reason we only read those two is because they're so thick. Uh, Paul wants us to, uh, or wants Titus uh, to, to tell believers to pursue godliness <clears throat> when it comes to rulers and authorities. These are states and governments that these believers would find themselves under. And what does this godliness look like in the beginning? It looks like submission. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think that there is a dirtier word right now in society than submission. Can you think of a word that is equally repulsive? The only one that I could maybe think that compares is authority, right? And so here we have, uh, imagine the current repulsiveness of having these two together. But it's not merely reserved for society at large, right? If we're honest with ourselves, many, many of us still have PTSD from COVID, from government restrictions, from as, as we worked through those a number of years ago. And just a reminder of what we find in Scripture, we don't have time to sort of just settle into that, uh, but just a reminder of what we find in Scripture. Number one is that God is the source of all authority. God is the source of all authority, whether it's government, family, church, any of those arenas, God is the source of those authorities. Number two, uh, the submission to those authorities is submission to God. This is what we find in Scripture, that we submit, when, when we submit to those authorities, we submit to them in Scripture as to the Lord. And then number three, our submission to these authorities is expected, but not unlimited. It's expected, but not unlimited. If any of these authorities command us differently or prohibit us from obeying God, we choose God. We choose God. So we see this a number of times in Scripture. We see this in Romans 13, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, and then our passage as well here. But in our passage... Paul's pretty concise. He's not trying to lay out a biblical theology of authority and submission when it comes to the government. He says, submit to the authorities. How? Well, look at, at verse 1 again. Obedience and readiness for every good work. You notice this isn't just sort of like getting out of the way. This isn't just sort of trying to ignore and do our own things. No, this is an active submission. Now, we might think, you know, Paul, you, know, you have no idea what we have to put up with, right? And, and I would agree with you. I think you're right. But Paul did have an idea of what Titus had to put up with. He knew what the believers in Crete had to put up with. One historian from the first century BC describes life in Crete like this. That's how he puts it. It would be impossible to find, except in some rare instances, personal conduct more treacherous or a public policy more unjust than in Crete. This is Polybius, who is a historian, and, and he's writing these words. These were the days of occupying armies. These were the days of Caesars uh, telling and declaring themselves to be gods and, and, and commanding worship and so on. These are the days that Paul writes, be submissive to rulers and authorities. But Paul goes on in verse 2, and he says, Older men, are, no, he says, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, 
and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. You notice that this is not just godliness towards uh, rulers and authorities, towards government, government. This is godliness towards all people. The word perfect there, when it says perfect courtesy, I was sort of thinking this is a Canadian verse, isn't it? Show perfect courtesy, right? Uh, no, that, that word perfect there means all or every kind of courtesy, every kind of consideration for people. And do you see the expanding scope of the gospel? It starts with, you know, godly leadership, and then it expands to godliness within the body, within the church. But it doesn't stop there. It even goes further to godliness within society. Look at verse 8. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. So do you notice here that those who believed in God, who is that? That's us. Those are the, that, that's the church. And our devotion to good works is excellent and profitable to who? To people, to all people. That's everyone. That's our neighbors. That's our community. As believers, we're not called to silo ourselves off, to remove ourselves from the world, right? In it, but not of it. But in it, in it enough that we can be submissive, that we can be ready for every good work, that we can avoid speaking evil, that we can uh, avoid quarreling, that we can show every consideration to all, to be humble. You know, this reminds me, this is not new, what Titus is writing. This is uh, what we find throughout Scripture. This reminds me of, of uh, God's call to his people Israel while they were living in exile. This is Jeremiah 29, verse 5. And they're living in exile. They're under a foreign government. They're in a foreign city. They're in Babylon. And, and this, this call of God, the word of God, comes to his people through Jeremiah. And listen to what God says to Israel. In exile, he says in verse 5, Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Likewise, we are to live in such a way that in humility, we pursue the good of everyone. We pursue godliness in society. These are the good works Paul refers to. He refers to good works in verse 1, and then again in verse 8, and then in verse 14 as well. Let's look at some of the examples of godliness for Titus as Paul ends his letter, beginning in verse 12. When I send Artemis or Tychius to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to spend speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not to be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Again, Paul wants Titus and and the believers in Crete to pursue godliness in providing for others and helping those in need. And just like we saw last week, when it comes to living out the gospel, when it comes to this godliness, it's not only going to be accepting some behavior, godly behavior, but it also means renouncing other behavior, rejecting other behavior. And and there is pursuit of what we just read, and then there's rejection of others. Look at verse 9. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up divisions, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. So God's people are to reject foolish controversies. We're to reject those who, who stir up division. We are to reject those uh, to, to, who enter into those discussions because they are like the world. That's the, what the world does. Instead, uh, instead of getting un- caught up in a, what's unprofitable, what's worthless, 
No, we're, we are to know the difference and we are to pursue godliness. We are to be different. You know, I'm not sure if, if you've heard of the broken window theory. This is a, a theory that if a, if a window is broken in a building and if it's left unrepaired, that very soon all the windows in the building will be broken. And maybe you can attest to this. It's, it's, a, it's as if a broken window signals a lack of care, signals that no one cares. A number of years ago, a Stanford psychologist Philip Zimbardo, he tested this theory. And what he did was he parked an automobile without a license on a, on a street in the Bronx. And then he parked a very similar automobile, similar make, on a street in Palo Alto, California. So these are two similar neighborhoods. The only difference was that with the car in the Bronx, he put the hood up. You know, he just sort of put the hood up, the car in the Bronx. Well, in 10 minutes, that car was attacked by vandals. In, in 24 hours, most everything had been removed of value from the car, and that's when uh, the random destruction began. Windows being smashed, things being torn out of it. Now, the car in pa- Palo Alto, California, sat untouched for a week. And then what he did was he, he smashed one of the windows, and within 10 minutes, um, the car was turned upside down. Well, I think it was a couple hours. Within a couple hours, the car was turned upside down and had been utterly destroyed. There's something contagious about apathy. And not just when it comes to broken windows or graffiti, right? Not just in those areas. We have a natural bend when we see something to pull back, when we disagree with something, either to pull back or to put our fists up, right? And to fight when we see an opportunity. These are natural tendencies. But as God's people, we're called to resist those temptations and to be different. Not to join the crowd, but to instead pursue godliness in humility. Without speaking evil of others, ready to do any good work, every consideration. But we would be powerless to do do this, to accomplish this, to pursue godliness and to resist apathy, to resist destruction that comes so easily to us, if not for what we find in verses 3 and 4 of our chapter, 3 3 to 7 of our chapter. You know, Paul uses, he uses a similar structure in, in what we find in chapter 2. If you look at chapter 2, and you look at chapter 3, you see something very similar in the structure, even in the language that Paul is using. And what we find is that he grounds our work, our pursuit of godliness, he grounds it with God's work on our behalf. He grounds our pursuit of godliness in society with God's work towards us, on our behalf, with what God has done. And he starts with a reminder of who we once were in verse 3. Look at verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hating by, hated by others and hating one another. You notice that Paul begins to ground this call for submission. He begins to ground this call for for obedience, for every good work, for courtesy towards all people. He grounds it by mentioning that we were once like the world. That's who we once were. In fact, he lists in chapter in verse three, he lists seven vices, which are sort of comparable to the seven virtues in verses one and two that he calls us towards. And, And we have a common past with the world. Once we were hopeless enslaved to sin, hating one another. We were in that state. We were sinners. And then we have this beautiful statement in verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that amazing? When the goodness and loving kindness of our Savior appeared, That should remind us when we're thinking, when we're reading, to remind us of chapter 2, verse 11. Remember what we have, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. And if we jump down to verse verse 13, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Isn't that incredible, that, that, that picture of God's grace appearing? just appearing on the scene. It's not, it gets rid of any attempts or or thoughts of our own coercion towards that. No, God's grace 
it appears. And, and just in case we think that we had some part to play in bringing that about, Paul is very specific. He spells it out clearly. Look again. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that we might, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Our salvation, our, our cleansing by the Holy Spirit, this, this new birth by the Spirit, our justification uh, was not based on any righteous work on our own. These only come about by God's mercy, right? Verse 5. These only come about by God's grace, verse 7. He describes the Holy, Holy Spirit's work at conversion and in cleansing us, in renewing us, and that the Holy Spirit was poured out through whom? Through the Son, Jesus Christ. So these, these verses speak of salvation as being the work of our triune God on our behalf. But it's His work, not ours. You know, author Anton Gansky related a story about Henry Houdini or Harry Houdini, the famed magician, in his book, 40 Days. And he describes this story, and and he says that Houdini made a name for himself by escaping from every imaginable confinement. Straight jackets, multiple pairs of handcuffs clamped to his arms. He boasted that no jail cell could hold him. Time and time again, he would be locked in a cell only to appear minutes later. It worked every time but one. He accepted... Another invitation to demonstrate his skill, he entered the cell wearing his street clothes and the, cell, and the jail cell door shut. Once alone, he pulled a thin but strong piece of metal from his belt and began working the lock. But something was wrong. No matter how hard Houdini worked, he couldn't unlock the door. For two hours, he applied skill and experienced the lock, but failed time and time again. Two hours later, he gave up in frustration. The problem? The cell had never been locked. Houdini worked himself to near exhaustion trying to achieve what could be accomplished by simply pushing the door open. You know, this is, this is the state of many people today. Working to achieve righteousness. Struggling, struggling with all their might to escape sin. To be good enough. Not knowing that the door has been unlocked by the mercy and grace of God. And and we walk through that door by trusting in Jesus and his work on the cross for us and forgiving our sin in, in, in raising us to new life. This is another aspect of God's work. It's all his work in salvation. But we notice one other aspect in these verses. It's, it's not only that he saves sinners, but that he makes heirs. You notice that in verse 7. Receiving the hope of eternal life. This is the promise to be with him for all eternity. But let us not forget Paul's point in all of this. We can get, we can get caught up in just the amazingness of God's goodness, his loving kindness to us in verses 4 through 7. But remember his point. If we've received such goodness and loving kindness from God himself at such a great cost, should we not then extend that goodness, extend that loving kindness to everyone, even if it comes at the cost of submission, at biting our tongues, at loving kindness to everyone, even if it comes at the extent of of being gentle, at showing every courtesy to all people, Brothers and sisters, the the appearing of God's grace in our lives should change our appearance, should change how we act. It it requires us to live different, to live different. We, We should be noticeably different to the world by our conduct, noticeably different. Strange, yes, we should look strange to the world, but strangely engaged, strangely engaged as the church we should be the best members of society. Do these verses not speak to that? We should be leading the way 
when it comes to community improvement programs, when it comes to building playgrounds, when it comes to volunteering at events, filling out surveys, talking to our leaders. We should resist the urge to speak evil about our government, but just not them, anyone else. We should avoid quarrels the world gets so easily wrapped up in. We should be asking our neighbors, how, how can we love you well? What can we do? How can we be better neighbors? You know, a little while ago, uh, you know, Daryl mentioned that not a lot of people, newer people especially, are, uh, drive by the church anymore, right? Uh, a little while ago, I was talking with one of our actual neighbors near our church building about this, about being a better neighbor. And, and, and he, he said, you know, it'd be nice if, if when people are going to church, they could drive a little slower in front of our house, right? Um, and, and so in a few weeks, though you're excited to see our sanctuary expansion, just take it slow. Let the anticipation build as you drive uh, and, and, uh, and just drive slow there. But this isn't, this isn't a small thing. This is a way that we can show perfect courtesy to all people, to, to put their, their, their desires above our own, to consider them better than ourselves. And we, we notice that Unlike chapter 2, what's noticeably absent in our chapter, if we compare what's going on in the church and godliness in the church, what's different between godliness in the church and, and godliness in society, what's noticeably absent in our chapter is any attempt to teach or train society in godliness, to teach or train the world when it comes to godliness. Why? Because the goodness... And loving kindness of God has not appeared in their lives. Over and over again in Scripture, we see that relationship comes before responsibility. Grace comes before godliness. Anything else is earning. It's trying to earn God's effort. It's not our earning. It's His mercy. He saved us. That's why before we go out, we're going to be leaving in a couple minutes here. Before we go out to live different in our community... This week, it's good to be reminded of why we are different, of, of what took place, of how we came to be different. So I'm going to invite, I'm going to invite Carl to come up. I'm going to invite Dave to come up to join us as we prepare to celebrate communion. This is what makes us different. Not, not the elements, but what we celebrate. The appearing of God's goodness and loving kindness in our lives. And to celebrate that together. And so if you're united with Christ by faith in what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross, if you're trusting him for the forgiveness of your sin through his death and resurrection, we invite you to join with us to remember in humility who we once were and, and to celebrate the but now of Jesus's, of God's goodness and loving kindness appearing in our lives and what he's done. You know, this, this reminds me, maybe it's because we were in Luke for such a long time, but it reminds me of Luke chapter 1, verse 77. This is as, as Zechariah shares John the Baptist's calling and Jesus is coming. Listen to these words uh, before we pray in Luke chapter 1, verse 77. To give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of peace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy this morning. God, for the appearing of your goodness and loving kindness in Jesus. While we were yet sinners, Father, in your call for us to live different, this makes all the difference, God. Your grace in our lives. And Father, as we think of, of Christ's body that was broken for us so that we might become one body together, God, we, we praise you. God, we're so grateful for your grace that came at such a great cost that we have such a great Savior. We thank you, Lord. Amen.